Welcome everybody to 4 Easy Account Mapping Wins. We are so glad you are here. I am Sean Blanda, the VP of Content at Crossbeam, and joining me is VP of Partnerships, Chris Samilla. Chris, how you doing? Hey. This one is about uh, efficiency, it's about action, it's about getting stuff done as easy and smoothly as possible in Crossbeam for your partner program. Uh, we're gonna go over briefly just some account mapping best practices in Crossbeam that we've seen from the thousands of users uh, we've interacted with, seeing what works and what doesn't. Uh, we'll go over four easy wins, so the exact reports are run, the exact workflows, tips uh, based on our experience and other experiences uh, to make sure they are successful. And then we'll do a little Q&A. And in case you haven't noticed, Chris and I are coming to you from the distant past. Uh, this is all pre-recorded. We'll be in the chat answering Q&A as it comes up as we can, but then we will join you live later to answer your questions uh, about everything we cover here. Chris, anything you'd like to say before we jump in? No, just excited to get into the conversation. Really gonna be bringing to life like the stuff we do here at Crossbeam, drinking our own champagne. So excited to get into it. Uh, speaking of reasons to celebrate, uh, this is all based on uh, one of three actionable guides we've released in the month of August 2022. This one is the same name as the webinar, easy to find, four easy wins. Everything we talk about, it's the written version. Uh, so if you want the little, this is the video companion for this 20 page book, all full of screenshots and tips and, and actionable advice. Um, the other thing you need to know before we begin is uh, we are going to be poking around the Crossbeam app. So it really helps if you're a Crossbeam user to follow along here. If you're not, you can just go to app.crossbeam.com and sign up. But again, we are framing all this advice through how to do it in Crossbeam. Before we get started about the exact wins, let's, let's do a little mise en place like we're chefs. Let's rearrange everything. Let's make sure you have everything to get started. And we're gonna talk about some account mapping tips to get started. Uh, Chris, before I pull up the actual app, I know you get asked a ton of questions about like account mapping best practices. What would you say is the most common thing people ask you before they get started? Yeah, usually it kind of comes down into like, well, you know, how do I get past the security and privacy questions my organization might have? Um, so we got some good tips on, on that front. Uh, we'll show a link of, uh, to show kind of how Crossbeam does this. Um, we also, uh, you know, for our own partner team, a lot of times it's people asking like, well, which types of information might I want to share with my partners? Um, and so that's where the populations functionality in Crossbeam gets really useful, uh, which we'll show in a few minutes, which is, you know, there's these standard populations that help us sort of define the sets of customers, B2B customers, and how they relate to your own business. Because um, based on whether they're a prospect or an opportunity or a customer, that unlocks a bunch of workflows uh, for you to do with your partners. Um, so those are generally kind of like high, high level stuff, um, but excited to dive into deeper here. Uh, we'll, we'll cover off some tips as we're going. Let's give you one better than a list of tips. How about a checklist? These are the things you should have in order to maximize the workflows and the four easy wins. Um, it's it can be common that you have a few of these and not all these, that's okay, but this is what good looks like, this is best practice. So first is you need to have a data source connected. That's available at app.crossbeams slash data sources or click on your little avatar right here, data sources will be taken to this page and you will be able to connect a uh, series of CRMs, you could do Google Sheets if you must, uh, HubSpot, we have lots of different options here and this is what makes sure you have live action, uh, real-time data to affect your account mapping. This is to make sure you're reflecting reality in your uh, uh, account mapping. Uh, the other thing uh, in the checklist is, okay, you have your data source, is standard populations. So you can see that here, uh, prospects, opportunities, customers. This is kind of the, the, the flour and the butter and the eggs of making the cross beam cake. This is like the, the raw ingredients. Um, by having standard populations, uh, all these four easy wins we're about to describe revolve around one of these three. Uh, populations. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add about like these three and why they're so important? Yeah, definitely. So this is this is the, all the most common workflows kind of kick off on the backside of these these standard populations. You can also create custom ones. Um, so for like, our own team, you know, we we look at we're a PLG or product led company. We have a lot of customers who may be on free plans uh, versus paid plans, and so sometimes giving some more definition around you know, the, the exact type of customer that might be, you may want to share that with certain partners. Um, and so 
Um, you may not need to think about all that up front. The most important thing is like work with your sales force administrator or your rev ops person, or if you're really lucky, you have a partner ops person uh, that can help you get the connection between your CRM and Crossbeam so you can identify those customers, prospects, and open opportunities. And adding to the checklist, so you might see here the sharing default. So you can share just strictly overlap counts, right? The number of overlapping prospects, opportunities, and customers you have. That's a good start. And we'll talk about how that's a good start. But to really take advantage of cross beam and real-time account mapping and you really kick a lot of these workflows in order, you should be sharing very specific fields to help make them actionable. Uh, as an example, this is an overlap count, right? There are 13 customers overlapping between fictional company Crab Blossom, which is who we are in this, versus Bozala, right? So that tells us a little bit, but we could certainly use more information about those accounts to action them. Um, anything else to add before we, we keep going? Yeah, I mean, I think on that um, kind of that matrix, this is where a lot of the partner teams spend their time is just looking at these sort of different combinations of overlaps and what you can do with this. Um, you can, in an early stage partnership, also just share counts or overlap counts, where when you're vetting whether or not you should even work with a partner, a lot of times early on, you may only want to share the number of overlaps instead of the actual company names and, and humans at your company working on those accounts. And so... You know, from a workflow perspective, it may be, hey, let's connect on Crossbeam. Let's get our MNDA in place first. Um, see those overlap counts. And if there's like no overlaps and you're looking at them as a potential tech partner, you just inherently know, OK, well, I'm going to have to probably do some more work here to actually build the market with this partner versus like we've connected to some people and we're like, oh, great. There's like hundreds of overlapping mutual customers. This is going to be a little bit easier to get things moving together. Um, so it's a really good practice just to kind of like eyeball, you know, where is this relationship possibly going and how hard might it be to get it moving? Um, and so that's just kind of play into your decision making. But this matrix becomes really useful for that. So we know uh, in real life, uh, partnering up isn't always as simple as pressing a button. There's actual humans involved and they have reservations and objections and things they might need to know about. Uh, here's some common partner objections we see or, or roadblocks and, and we'd love to just hit them real quick and talk about how to overcome them. Uh, first is security, crossbeam and partner ecosystem platforms and connecting your data to a partner ecosystem platform is a somewhat new thing. And uh, some people may have reservations about where is my data going? Um, Chris, when on the crossbeam side, on when we're partnering, with someone, how do you how do you uh, overcome that particular reservation? Yeah, totally. Um, so some folks who may not have used something like Crossbeam uh, are just generally curious how to navigate getting their organization to, to adopt something like this. Um, and a lot of a lot of that just comes down to like helping explain like what exactly is Crossbeam doing. We have obviously a, a team that can help you have these conversations. Um, we also just generally have found that when when people partner professionals explain like what exactly is Crossbeam doing, a lot of times, especially for tech companies. We're sharing those those company names and and maybe like the, the website domain of these businesses and not as commonly the actual humans like uh, at your customers and so because we're not sharing the humans you don't have to worry as much about GDPR or CCPA or some of those uh, other kind of uh, legal frameworks for sharing like actual customer names and and things like that. Um, we absolutely do have people that share those things or customers that do share those things and they have, you know, a privacy agreement with their partners and protections in place to do that on Crossbeam's website. Like you can go and see how we do this. Uh, we'll have the link to that so you can kind of see the framing we use. Um, so that's part of the kind of component to it. The other piece is just helping your business understand that like there have been people doing this for a long time. This idea of account mapping has been around for as long as kind of B2B collaboration has been out there. It's just they, there's not been a platform to act as an escrow service to help you do this in a very secure fashion. So this is actually in many respects more secure than how teams operate uh, currently if they're not using something like Crossbeam. So just having that conversation with your organization helps them understand this is, this is, a, this is a very common and growing path for partners teams to actually collaborate with one another. You can look at security.crossing.com to see all the security bona fides we have. I encourage you to compare this to any other partner ecosystem platform or just sharing spreadsheets. I assure you we will come out on top. The other thing is some people might be nervous to share specific fields or they just want to share overlaps. And something I know we do and other people do is um, start with the NDA, right? To help like free up and, and ease some concerns. Uh, Chris, what's your advice for people navigating that? 
Yeah. So for our team, like we definitely always try to get a, a mutual NDA in place with our partners. Um, sometimes we just do a mutual NDA by itself. Other occasions we'll go through a discovery process with a prospective partner and we're like, hey, there's a lot of philosophical alignment on how we want to go to market together. Let's just get the full partner agreement in place. And inside our partner agreement is a mutual NDA. Either way, before we usually connect on Crossbeam, uh, we will always want to have that mutual NDA in place. Um, that That is what kind of allows us to feel comfortable about sharing stuff with folks. And then there's, as Sean was mentioning, there's sort of like specific fields even within Crossbeam we may share at different stages of relationships. Um, and so in the very beginning, a lot of times all you really need is just the B2B account name, uh, and, the, and the people, the AEs, the CSMs that might own that account. Um, down the road, there's other stuff we can share, which we're show, we'll show in a few minutes here. Lastly, quickly, some people are reluctant to connect to data source. We do have the option to connect Google Sheets or CSEs. Don't recommend this for the best workflows, but it could be something good to get started. Um, and the reason is that that's a static thing. It won't update with your CRM, but might help kick off and, and get people comfortable with eventually connecting a data source. Um, Okay, now that we hit up those uh, checklists, you've connected data source, you have standard populations, you shared fields, and now you have to invite your partner. That's where these four easy wins take over. Uh, let's get started with the first easy win. This is one of the most standard ways to get the most value out of Crossbeam immediately. Uh, this win is about retention, uh, for optimizing retention, as well as vetting possible partners. So use this win, use this play, if you are measured by integration adoption, customer retention, or account expansion. So this is the heart of this, is this overlap right here. It's the customer or customer overlap. You, how many of your customers are also their customers? And as you know, this can be the foundation for should you develop an integration. This is your, your like kind of total market um, for developing an integration. Uh, we have a few use cases for this customer and customer overlap. Love to walk through them one at a time. Uh, the first one is, again, vetting a partnership. Should you even get think about building an integration if you don't share a bunch of customers? Chris, why is this important? Why does this save time? Yeah, 100%. So this is like one of the more interesting just ways very early on to get a sense of like how hard is it going to, how hard will it be to potentially work with this partner? Um, if you have very few overlaps, you're going to have to go build the market together. Um, we definitely have had this at Crossbeam where um, we're the bigger uh, customer base than, than the prospective partner. Um, and the reality is, is a great use case from an integration perspective could absolutely, you know, supersede the, uh, the hesitation because you don't have a bunch of mutual customers. Um, but it's just good to eyeball this and be like, all right, we will have less people to talk to about potential use cases, uh, obviously potentially using the integration. So your ability to grow is going to be kind of linked to how fast they can grow as a company, um, which could be ultimately driven by a super valuable integration. So it's good to see this early on, though, because um, obviously the one component of this is if you have a ton of overlaps, um, you'll have a lot more opportunity to go out and talk to people, make sure that they see value in your two businesses working together um, and kind of the, the wheel will turn faster potentially with less effort. And we, we have an entire uh, ebook on this called Before You Build about how to vet integration. And this is the cornerstone of it. Um, this, these shared customers can be your, bat, your beta testers, the people who end up doing case studies, the people who end up infusing your integration marketing later down the road. Um, use case number two is co-marketing and integration to, to drive retention, right? So let's pretend you built the integration. Who do you market it to? You market it to this group. So we have a lot of awesome uh, integrations with marketing automation platforms like HubSpot, where you can just send this list and execute a bunch of campaigns, sending a very relevant call to action uh, to people who could install this integration. And that way, the people who aren't shared customers, who can't, you don't waste their time. Um, Chris, can you talk about maybe you know, some of the partner cloud integrations we have with marketing automation platforms? And then as well, like how, how does this help drive adoption when you have this list of shared customers? Yeah, so the, the kind of overlapping mutual customers can be almost approached in two ways. One of them is you could manually go in as a partner manager and be like, great, there's 100 overlapping mutual customers. I can go work with my go-to-market team to try to get them to reach out to these customers, to tell them about new integration. Um, that's how we kind of operate for many of us in the current, current world. What some of our more advanced customers are doing is 
they are trying to create as much efficiency as humanly possible so that the partner manager doesn't have to do everything manually. And this is where the partner cloud comes in, which is we're taking this list of B2B accounts and we're sending it to an email marketing solution like a Marketo uh, to do that marketing automation workflow. We're sending it to ABM campaigns. Uh, we have a bunch of great technology partners on this front, Rollworks, Terminus, a number of technologies that you can, in essence, add this list of B2B accounts to any number of different campaigns. There's even in-app notifications as well. Um, so think of the ways that you currently try to drive adoption of integrations. And most likely, it's a lot of human-led effort. These partner cloud integrations bring a lot of scale to that so that as soon as overlaps happen, they get added to campaigns so that the partner manager doesn't have to spend as much time on that. Yeah, anytime you can turn the data from push to pull or pull to push, right? You can send it to where people are already working, makes your life easier. Uh, use case number three is cross-selling and account expansion. So let's say your customer is in the marketing department, your partner's customer is in the sales department, you can help expand into each other's uh, accounts or into the, each other's contacts and departments. And that's why uh, sharing um, fields as such as your contact at the company can help reveal that information, right? The fact that you're selling to one department, they're selling to an adjacent department. Yeah, and we can definitely, I mean, this is, a, this is a component of like, you may have a product that actually through consumption, uh, which could be driven by an integration, all of a sudden an existing customer becomes an upgrade. And if your partner team's compensated on sourced revenue, some of them will actually get source revenue credit for driving upgrades of even existing customers. So um, this is an interesting, you know, sort of intersection between I want to drive integration adoption to, to drive retention, but also this could help you hit your goals for driving net new revenue for the business just from an existing customer base. And let's look at what that report actually looks like. So again, the account mapping matrix, these are standard populations, customer, customer. Uh, we already went through the trouble of creating this report. I named it retention and vetting. You can see it's my customer list uh, with my partner's customer list. Um, and these are the fields. So we click configure columns. This is why sharing fields with your partner is really important because you have a lot of optionality here. Um, these are the fields that we think work best. Uh, account type, website, region, as well as AE name, AE email on both sides. Health score, right? You can pitch more and better things to some a healthier account. Um, Chris, what are some of the more important fields here? What would what would someone use them for? Uh, whether it's for vetting a partnership or expanding to the account. Yeah, so you can, you know, a lot of teams may just share that kind of like B2B account name and then like which population it falls into. So of course, like mutual customers in this in this scenario. As you share additional information, so like maybe they're the customers in a certain region or, you know, even more interesting potential like product utilization type of data or health score data. Because if you think about it, like tech partner teams, if we're trying to get somebody to use an integration, if that account is unhealthy, that could be a harder customer to try to bring up an integration to. On the flip side, it could be an incredibly important uh, data point um, because your CSMs might be looking for a hook to try to get them to extract more value from your solution. Uh, so showing either yourself these these the, you know this data, so like your own partner team actually seeing the health scores and things like that in Crossbeam, or going ahead and sharing that with the partner, you do have the flexibility to kind of you know do single player mode and see this information for yourself in Crossbeam, or you can proactively share this with your partner. Um, so I think the health score stuff is really interesting. I think the the fact that, you know, the AE and the CSMs are something that's visible as well. Um, this is obviously really helpful because you may want to have a subset of your partner of your, sorry, your, your AEs that are trained up on maybe a new integration. So if you have like a huge sales organization, you may cherry pick three to five AEs that get trained up on say some new beta integration. And so you might wanna just filter out and say, great, I only want these five AEs to be, you know, working with me on the on this initiative. Um, and so this is where like, kind of thinking through the mechanics of how broad of a campaign do we wanna to do to the, go, to the go to market team about this integration? Um, and then like how healthy or not are these accounts? And maybe even that, again, that geographic region as well, like you may wanna just focus on a subset of like North America or Europe, et cetera. Um, so this helps you really get really precise about where are you spending your time with this specific tech partner about chasing these mutual customers? One one thing that we always try to try to emphasize, right, is like, Yes, the fields make this 
make this easier, but like know that not all overlaps are created equal. And sometimes you don't know that until you have this information, right? Like you care more about a certain region, you care more about strategic accounts, you care more about a certain AE's book for whatever reason. Um, when you have that extra information, you can get increasingly fine tuned and strategic here. Some tips for just running this is, uh, when you are approached by a partner, this is probably one you want to run first, right? This is like kind of making sure that the universe in which you both play in, there's enough overlap to accomplish a bunch of different partner uh, motions. The other one is account owners can vary per, by company. Some consider the AE the account owner. Some people consider the CSM as an account owner. That can be a, a, a little different. And then the other thing is know what an integration is worth to you because uh, Maybe a specific kind of integration, uh, the user has to pay to use, right? Versus one that's free. That makes a difference in uh, whether an integration is worth developing. Yeah, you may want to, um, you know, in essence, highlight uh, to Crossbeam which of these customers actually adopted an integration. Um, a lot of times that's coming out of like a data warehouse, which is then fed over to Salesforce or HubSpot or any of your CRM environments. Grabbing that information and bringing it back into Crossbeam helps you sort of, you know, ignore those accounts potentially if you're trying to drive net new integration adoption. Um, it also obviously highlights if you're, you've been doing great work and you're getting a bunch of people to use these integrations, that's a report that you could build out and give to your marketing team to go and actually try to get some use cases or case, sorry, case studies built out. Um, so I think grabbing that, whether, grabbing that field that tells you whether or not the integration has been activated is also a pretty helpful data point. Easy win number two, the pipeline review. This one is great if you're measured by partner source, partner influence, and partner attached, which is pretty much everybody. Um, this particular easy win, um, you don't need an integration for, and is also probably uh, a little later in your partnership after you do maybe some of the actions we described in easy win one. This becomes a little easier, some familiarity, some trust. So what we use this opportunity and opportunity overlap for, which is right here on the grid where it says, 47 is to help share intel on your in-flight deals, right? They're pitching, they're talking to the opportunity, so are you. You can help each other out by what are you learning, what are you seeing, what are their objections, how can you help each other out? And maybe, just maybe, you could co go in together if you already have an integration. If you don't have an integration, hey, all information is, is helpful. And that's one reason we call this the pipeline review. When your reps are doing their pipeline review, something's stuck, something's not moving as fast, it's a good opportunity for you as the partner manager or the partner leader to say, hey, maybe I can connect you to someone to help unstick this. Um, Chris, any, any, any thoughts or advice or have, how, how have you done this exact, uh, this exact win? Yeah, so we, we definitely see this as sort of a progression over time. So a lot of times we'll spend a lot of energy initially on that mutual customer overlaps, and then we'll move into once the go-to-market team kind of knows each other, we'll start actually getting AEs working on open opportunities together. Um, <clears throat> this is where sort of the equitability side of partnerships kind of kicks in, where it's like you want to make sure that your team is is supporting your partner as much as they are for you. Um, so having good attribution around the amount of collaboration occurring here is even probably more important than it is in kind of the phase one of mutual customers. Um, but this is where you start to really see the meat and potatoes of like real revenue being impacted on net new opportunities. So if you can get the flywheel turning on your AEs wanting to collaborate with your partner on these open opportunities, you're going to be in a very good spot. We did the, the sample report here, which again, your opportunities versus their open opportunities, some of the fields we're sharing. Uh, you can see some dollar amounts here, right? The amounts, the days of pipeline, days to close. You can use these fields to see what, what deals are lagging, what, what, what's running behind, where are the highest leverage opportunities for that partner introduction or that partner context, you know, for deals that are higher up in the amount. Um, you can also, uh, it's hard to introduce your reps if you don't know who's working with what deal? So that's why we recommend sharing the uh, account rep or account executive name and email. Um, anything, anything to add here, Chris, about these fields or like why does this enable things and make things easier for providing a, a context? Yeah, this is where the partner manager, a lot of times they may be sitting in pipeline reviews with the sales leadership team and they're seeing opportunities for where you have open opportunities and you don't have a partner attached, whether it's a channel partner or a technology partner. And so sharing through into Crossbeam some of the data that either the partner team should be seeing to help identify where partners should be assisting, or if you you know have a good trusted relationship with your partner, you could share some of this information across to them because then you can kind of right-size things. You can realize, okay, 
we're, you know, we're selling a six figure deal. They're selling a, a, a five figure deal. Um, that might be really helpful context to understand like the scale of the opportunity as well as like, is this going to close next week? Cause if we're going to close next week, like my ability to actually influence things here might be too short of a time horizon. Um, and so this, this data about like how long before it closes, what is it worth, et cetera, just helps you kind of build the right strategy for which of the, the opportunities should you be spending time on to work with the partner. And, and having this report is how you kind of become your rep's best friend. You know, they, they're, they're voicing in a pipeline review. They're having trouble with something. Here you may have the information to, to help them. Um, other kind of tips for, for running this, um, start small, pick a small number of reps, especially a rep who's more amenable to, to co-selling with a partner. Um, sometimes you can start with title sharing. So maybe you can share the title of your contact at a particular company and not the exact contact information, right? Uh, you can see maybe your partner's contact is the CRO. You can ask them, hey, is that relationship actually good? Are you willing to do an introduction? No. That way they don't expose their Rolodex and it kind of keeps uh, the gates on, you know, as you, as you were early. Um, other thing is you can put this information, this overlap and all the tools your reps use to, to collaborate. Uh, I know, Chris, we, we talk about Slack and some other stuff we have in the partner cloud. Um, what should people consider uh, sending their partner data into? Yeah, this is a super fun part of Partner Cloud, which is like you, you have this overlap information about sales collaboration opportunities. We can pump this into Slack. Uh, we can send this over into Sales Loft and Outreach. Uh, we have some next gen integrations coming down the pike for the second half of the year. Uh, Lean Data is one in particular that I'm super excited about because we can get that partner data into Lean Data and then you can create whatever workflow you want with your RevOps leader. Um, so you want it to go over to Microsoft Teams or you want it to go into outreach on a certain date with a certain you know text wrapped around it. There's a lot more flexibility when we get our partner data into these kind of revenue orchestration technologies. Um, so Lean Data is the first out the gates coming here in the in the near future. It's going to have that. Um, but there's a lot of other ones we're working on. I mean, even Crossbeam ourselves, we have a that's exciting announcement soon um, on the uh, on the partnered side of things, which is a company we acquired uh, a few months back. Um, we think this this collaboration between partnerships and sales is really core to how partner teams help drive value for their businesses. So we're spending a lot of energy on this stuff right now. Yeah, automatic's better. But in the meantime, you can be sitting in those sales meetings, like just voicing it yourself. Obviously, when you mature, send that data in places so you don't have to be there raising your hand saying, hey, have you considered this? Two other things, if you are going to co-sell together, you're gonna to go into deal together. It helps to have better together messaging. It helps to have an integration. And then again, partnerships are about people. Do you have people on your team that work well with people on their team? Probably should optimize for those co-selling relationships above all others. Um, speaking of making your sales team happy, let's get to easy win number three. Easy win number three, deal acceleration. Closing deals is great, closing them faster, that's better. Uh, this one helps you do that. So again, if you are measured on partner source, partner influence and partner attached, right? This is the play for you. Uh, this use case is rather similar. This lets you know all the deals you can get a partner assist on. This is the overlap of your opportunities to their customers or the flip, right? Reciprocate their opportunities to your customers. These are people that you are trying to close, your team is trying to close, that your partner has already closed, right? So they certainly can give you a, a warm introduction to the account. They can give you context, they can give you intel, they can give you lots of information uh, to help your sales team close the deal. This is truly uh, partner influence revenue um, and it can, it can be partner sourced in some situations. Um, Chris, how does this play normally work? How does this win normally work? How do people convince their partner to, to introduce them to their, their customers? Yeah, this is a fun one because when you get to this point, this is where you can create a ton of value for your organization because um, obviously you're coming sort of being the hero and you're getting a partner to help um, accelerate a, an opportunity for you. Uh, that other rep probably knows what the procurement cycle look like. They probably have some understanding of the key buyers over there, uh, especially if you have the same ideal customer profile. Um, so as long as you have a trusted relationship with that partner and there is some form of equitability behind the partnership where there is a construct for your partner to be able to 
to know that by them doing you a favor, your team will reciprocate when the time comes. That's really core to this. And also why this is sort of one of the more mature motions, Um, because if you go into a new partnership and the first thing you do is try to go and get a bunch of introductions or a bunch of help on on opportunities for you that are customers for your partner, you're going to start to maybe burn out that partner before you build up your own social capital with that partner. So this is like a really good thing to just you know, it's it's a more advanced motion with with Crossbeam. We're using this with your partner, but it's also incredibly valuable. And for organizations that are at that stage of maturity, like this is where a ton of revenue can get impacted by the partner team. And this is these are the fields we we suggest sharing. You can see like amount, knowing what's at stake here if you close the deal, getting the rep on the other team to ask them whether they can introduce you or are willing to introduce you. Um, this requires a lot of communication, I think, between the partner leaders on both sides, right? Like making sure that there's a lot of trust to go ahead to either reach out to the rep directly, or I know some people say, hey, every month we'll exchange five. Um, whatever whatever works for your stage in partnership, but nailing this motion is how the revenue uh, comes comes flowing in uh, much, much easier, much faster. Um, this is a sample kind of checklist of how to do it. Now, this is a somewhat more manual way, and there's also ways to send the data automatically. Uh, Chris, how does this usually work, right? If I, if I go to you and I say, hey, I want an introduction, um, what do I need to think about? What do I need to consider when approaching this with my partner? This whole concept of uh, being able to share back and forth, facilitating each other's success on these sales opportunities is can be incredibly impactful. Um, I think the, the key for this is also, uh, as you know, here on the checklist, we call out, you know, finding the friendly reps that can start to evangelize the impact of doing this well, um, especially if you're new at, at getting your organization to co-sell, you need to find a rep who's willing to, to be thinking a little more long-term that when they get asked for help from a partner, they're willing to do that. Even if there isn't an immediate opportunity for them to see where they're going to get benefited from that, they're in it for the long game. They're in it, they're in it there to build the partnership. Those folks we've seen time and time again, those AEs that actually understand that they become your evangelist of, of the concept of co-selling and you want to stay, you want to really highlight those people. So when you go into your sales quarterly meeting, the, the reps that are co-selling really, really effectively and are, and are thinking about sort of the equitability of these partnerships, you want to get those people front stage evangelizing the power of, of partnerships and co-selling. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how we think about it. Yeah, whatever forum you have to talk to your sales team, whenever someone closes a deal in this way or helps out a partner, man, you should tell them. <laughs> Shout out from the rooftops. And if you want more information about like a, a good co-selling uh, workflow, we know it's very complicated. It has to be done in just the right way. Uh, we have a whole book on this called No Opportunities Lost. It's one of the three guides, along with Four Easy Wins uh, that we've released this month. Uh, has a exact timeline and exact kind of sequence for, for rolling this out. Tips for this win, as we said, uh, don't just go asking uh, for introductions uh, from the rep themselves. Start with the partner manager. You'd want to know if someone was coming to your reps directly. Try to reciprocate, at least you know, as you're as you're building that trust. And then you can scale this up. What we described is you know somewhat manual. Is a lot of person to person communications. Imagine people getting notified of new overlaps, you know, in Slack, uh, in Salesforce, um, or even in CrossFit with some stuff we have coming out. Uh, this stuff is only going to get faster, only get smoother. Um, set up those workflows and build that trust now. And now we're taking it home. Easy win number four, net new opportunities. This is probably my favorite one. Uh, if you can have a favorite easy crossbeam, easy win. Uh, this is this is true partner source revenue and net new pipeline. This is the overlap between your prospects and their customers, right? These are people that they can accelerate and help you close who maybe weren't even in the opportunity bucket. Um, so, Chris, this is... We, you and I talked about how this is like the, 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 the holy grail. This is the end of the maturity curve. Why is it so important? Why is it so powerful? Why should people start working to this? Yeah, this is where things get really impactful for your organization. If you can get a partner to this end of the maturity curve. And the reason this is sort of at the end is you do not have a relationship with these B2B companies that you're chasing. This is, this is prospects land and your partner, if they do have a relationship, if they're willing to introduce you, then that is a very, very good place to be in because now you're going to start cranking on partner source revenue. Um, there's also like 
a bunch of interesting different workflows you can kick off of this. You know, you can potentially deploy your SDRs to work with your partner. Uh, if you have good construct around that, you can have your AEs also involved driving this. And you can also think about marketing automation and other ways where you can take these lists of prospects for you that are customers for your partner. And if you know the technology stack of these B2B companies, you could be running ABM campaigns and things like that, that you, you sort of know things about that company that could tweak your value proposition messaging to catch their attention. We absolutely see some of our more sophisticated customers starting to do this and it pays off because it's hyper accurate data. When, when your partner tells you who their customers are, your marketing team can get very, very precise and very targeted with the value proposition that you send out. This sits at this overlap, right? Which is, you know, your prospects to their customers. And again, always do the reverse, right? You can just be asking for all these introductions and help do the same for them. Uh, we look at the report and the columns we're, we're pulling in, right? Pretty basic, just who is responsible for each account and how do I connect them so they can help me help accelerate the deal? Um, is there anything else to add or any other field that might be good to consider for this report, Chris? I think this pretty much covers it. I mean, I think the, the goal is just getting that list of B2B companies that your partner has a relationship with and then figuring out what is your strategy that gets that account activated? Is it SDRs? Is it an AE working with other AE? Is it an automation campaign of some type? Um, but this is, uh, as, as Sean mentioned, super important. You also are equitable in this sense because um, you want the love to come the other direction too. Uh, and if you can do this consistently on both sides, you're going to be very, very popular with your uh, your sales leadership. Yeah, then you're, then you're flying. Um, some things to keep in mind. Uh, obviously, when you pull in prospects, those lists can get unwieldy, especially if you know they have a ton of customers. So filters can be your friend. Filtering for regions by rep uh, that might be that might be helpful. Um, the other thing is this always helps when you automate. So imagine getting a notification every time one of your prospects becomes a customer of your partner. That could be a good sign that you can pursue maybe uh, an introduction or at least, hey, how'd you close a deal? Can you help my rep out? Um, what are some of the partner cloud integrations that could help out with that, Chris, if people are interested? Yeah, this touches a bunch of them. So all the marketing automation stuff that we have, um, you know, the different sort of sales notification orient oriented integrations. So think of like outreach and sales loft, the upcoming, upcoming lean data one, um, even the, the team collaboration ones. So Slack and, and things like that. Um, this does touch a ton of the partner cloud. So I think it's, this is one of those areas where also thinking about data warehouse environments to pump partner data into can be really valuable. Cause if you think about it, your strategy for how your sales organization is spending energy, if you know that by co-selling with a certain tech partner leads to a lot of success, pumping that into a data warehouse so that you can do analysis on, okay, hey, we're trying to break into an international market. Does our partner already have a presence there? Um, is there certain uh, you know, high overlaps with certain AEs or certain verticals? This is where blending that crossbeam data with other sets of data, whether it's technographic or firmographic, and doing that in a data warehouse and then visualizing it, this is where the really sophisticated teams are starting to get very, very smart about how partner data impacts the sales team strategy. Okay, that is the fourth easy win. So if we recap, the four easy wins are retention and vetting, that's the customer-customer overlap, uh, pipeline review, deal acceleration, and we just covered net new opportunities. All of those are in our new ebook, Four Easy Wins, uh, The Crossing Guide to Account Mapping. We detail, if you missed some of the columns we were sharing, the fields we were sharing, they're all listed in here, all the tips, uh, all the workflows, all the advice for executing these four uh, wins. And with that, Chris and I, live Chris and I are gonna come and answer all your questions that you have, um, as well as uh, talk out, you know, if something's working for you or any other advice you have for running these wins, if you run them yourself, we'll see you on the other side. Awesome, thank y'all.